Hello, this is Dr. Dan Baker at Colorado State University, and today we'll be reviewing for Civil Engineering 261 Dynamics, and we'll be talking about rigid body kinetics. So rigid body kinetics is the last quarter of the content we covered in class, essentially covering rigid bodies and all of the forces, accelerations, velocities um, that interact on those bodies. So let's get into the content. So we started in chapter 17, 17 of our textbook looking at mass moments of inertia, right? So these are not the area moments of inertia which we covered in statics, but mass moment of inertia, really meaning this resistance to rotation of a rigid body. And the primary equation that we used here as because we focused on um, composite bodies was this moment of inertia about whatever axis is specified equals the moment of inertia about the centroid plus the MD squared. Now, if we're talking about the IX, this D is actually going to be the Y bar term. If we're talking about the IY, this is actually going to be the X bar term, right? The distance from your designated axes to the centroid of each individual piece. And so uh, we've used this parallel axis theorem um, to move that moment of inertia around, noting that the moment of inertia about the centroid is going to be the smallest moment of inertia about any point on that body. No, no point on the body, no axes on the body will have a smaller moment of inertia than about the centroid. We also talked about the radius of gyration. The radius of gyration uh, is equal to basically the square root of the moment of inertia about that same point divided by m. It's often used in this form over here. If you're given a radius of gyration about the same point you want to have the moment of inertia square that radius of gyration times mass and end up with your moment of inertia next we got into kind of the meat of chapter 17 looking at uh, newtonian kinetics newtonian using f equals ma and m equals i alpha now when we're doing the f equals ma part very similar to what we did with particles now, the only difference here is that we need to have the acceleration of the centroid every single time. We can't use acceleration of any other point besides the centroid. But because this is a vector equation on our two-dimensional problems, we can split this out into an x version and a y version. It's always advantageous if you line up one of your acceleration terms, if you have linear acceleration, with that linear acceleration. Then you're only going to have one sum of force equation. Everything perpendicular to that is going to look more like a statics equation. Sum of forces equals zero. Then we get into our moment term. Now, if we sum our moments about the centroid, point G, then we're able to take just the moment of inertia I bar times alpha, right? Alpha is constant for the whole body, so it doesn't matter what point alpha is about. Um, but if you want to sum your moments about some other point, we'll move over here to this right-hand side, and you can see here that summing moments about some other point, point P, we still add in the I bar alpha, but we need to add to it this kinetic moment term. So essentially this is an inertial moment. And so what we're doing here is we're crossing that distance between our current point back to the centroid and then crossing it into whatever the acceleration was there of the centroid. Let's take a look at this piece um, in a quick interactive. All right, so here is this interactive looking at kinetic moments of non-centroidal points. And so we have a body here that's in fixed axis rotation, basically moving about its axis right there. Here's our centroid, point G. We can't move that, right? It's the center of this overall body. Um, but we can move basically this point that we're going to sum moments about. So here's my point P. And so we can see here that if we have point P down to the right and below the centroid, essentially those kinetic moment terms are these distances here. Here is Rn crossed into the tangential acceleration of the centroid. And so coming up here, crossing that in, we end up with a negative value from the right-hand rule. And then from point P, coming over here to the normal component of the acceleration, we come this direction, crossing into AGN, we get a positive component. You can see these right here, positive and then negative. And we can see overall this body um, has an assumed alpha given these two different accelerations, right? The total acceleration is coming down this way. That would make the overall alpha of this body in a negative negative direction. So you can see we can get some different signs depending on where that point of application is. If I move this point, let's say up here, now we're going to end up with a positive term as we cross Rn into the tangential term. 
uh, and then we're going to end up with a negative term coming over here to the center line, crossing that downwards into AGN. And so that's going to give us a negative kinetic moment term. Our alpha stayed exactly the same, but once again, this is just basically on the right-hand side of our M equals I alpha equation when we're summing moments about some point that isn't the centroid. One of the special places that we can select, and we'll see this in our equations, is actually this um, this, this fixed axis down, down here, right? Whether it's the fixed axis or whether it's the ICZV, you can see our alpha here is negative. We only end up having one single kinetic moment term, and that's going to be this distance crossed into this acceleration right here, giving us another additional negative moment. Both of those are negative, and so what we find there is that instead of using the kinetic moment equation, we could go ahead and transfer the moment of inertia down here to point P, and effectively we could take IP times the alpha of the body, and we get the exact same value. Or you can add together the I bar um, times alpha plus the um, R here. In this case, it would be of G relative to P crossed with the mass um, times this AGT, right? So all the signs there will be negative. All the signs come from the right-hand rule, right? So make sure you brush up on your right-hand rule. All right, now back over to our review sheet. We had some special cases using Newtonian kinetics for rigid bodies. One of those is if we had translation, right? So if we have translation, not only is alpha zero, right? The body's not rotating in translation. Hence, alpha is zero, so is omega zero, right? So there's, there's no alpha, there's no omega, no angular velocity, no change in angular velocity, which means no angular acceleration. So alpha will always be zero. So if you do end up summing moments at some point that isn't the centroid, then, um, of course, this first term, I alpha, goes to zero, but we're still going to have the kinetic moment term because the centroid will still have an acceleration, we'll still have this distance, we'll still have a mass, right? None of those go to zero for translation. All right, so let's go ahead and continue on with fixed axis rotation coming up section 17.4. In fixed axis rotation, because the axis point O and the centroid G have exactly the same direction for both tangent and normal, the tangent and normal axes, we then you know, find that fixed axis rotation is a, a workable um, coordinate system to comp compute the terms in fixed axis rotation. So all we're really doing here is we're specializing these acceleration terms, right? This acceleration term here to focus on what we know about tangent and normal acceleration, right? The normal acceleration being the, the omega squared basically back towards point O. And then, and keep in mind, this is the magnitude term, not the vector term. There'd be a negative in front of if we had the vector. And then we have our acceleration being perpendicular to the r vector, right, the alpha cross r giving us a sub t. And so it's really just a specialization using those tangent and normal terms. And then if we go ahead and some moments about the centroid, we just have that moment inertia i bar times alpha. Or if we want to ignore those pin forces that the, the, the support forces that are coming through point O, we go ahead and sum our moment around point O, shift our moment of inertia to point O, and just take it times alpha, right? And we went over that in the interactive, why this doesn't give us any of those right-hand rule sign errors. And that's because the alpha and the kinetic moment from the tangential acceleration are going in the exact same direction. So we can just sum up um, our overall terms, and it ends up being equivalent to this I naught times alpha. All right, another item we looked briefly at was the center of percussion, essentially defined the sweet spot of a bat or a tennis racket or something like that. And we found that this distance to Q, as long as you measure basically this Y bar, the distance from the fixed axes to the centroid of a body, and Q from the same spot, from the same end of the body, we know that Q is equal to the square of the radius of gyration divided by Y bar. Now, we know from, from earlier that we can find um, your radius of gyration as a square root of I over M, as long as your I is in the same spot that your K needs to be. Now, the last topic that we covered in 17.5 really was just kind of throwing everything together into general plane motion. So realize in general plane motion, we're going to use the, the, the main equations that we had up here um, listed earlier, right? These are kind of the overall governing equations. So these are the exact ones we use for, for general plane motion. A couple of notes here about general plane motion. Make sure to use a coordinate system that describes the motion of the center of mass. Now, most of the time in general plane motion, we'll often end up using 
a XY coordinate system, it doesn't mean that you have to. You could use tangent normal or a cylindrical R theta. It just kind of depends what the motion looks like. But realize that you're going to have to use the same coordinate system um, for all your equations. And so just make sure that things match up well um, between different points on the body. Third, make sure you have proper free body diagrams and rigid body motion computations. Okay, so you can't forget about your chapter 16 knowledge of rigid body kinematics, and you do need to draw correct free body diagrams and taking a look at summing your forces on the left hand side or summing moments on your equations. And then finally, the sign convention of your assumed velocity and acceleration must be consistent with the angular velocity and angular acceleration of the body. So just make sure that if you don't know the direction or you are assuming a direction, both of your omega and the centroidal velocities or acceleration, that those are lining up and working together. All right, on to chapter 18. Chapter 18 looked at still rigid body kinetics, now using work energy. Um, essentially, here in work energy, we added some additional terms that we hadn't included before. One of those is here um, adding in an additional rotational kinetic energy, one-half I bar times omega. Now, the kinetic energy term here technically can be about any point on the body. Most often, we do about the centroid. But as long as the velocity point and your I point, your moment of inertia, are about the same point that works fine the other thing to show here is that if you choose a point up here for your initial kinetic energy it has to be about the same point for your final because different points on the body do have different values of kinetic energy and so make sure that your points you select are consistent as well as consistency between the velocity and the i bar term if in doubt use the centroid and the centroid works just fine we had multiple work terms. Um, work can either be the variable U or the variable W. Um, still, we have work from a force being the dot product of our force and our displacement. Positive if we're moving with the displacement, negative going opposite that displacement. Our weight, if we're moving a body downwards in the direction of that force, it's positive. Negative if we're moving that body upwards. Um, a spring force, really a spring force here, we have to take a look at whether it's compressing or stretching and basically what is the um, overall force on a body. Uh, you can think that if you're stretching a um, a spring, your displacement is going to be in the opposite direction of that force. And so that would actually be um, negative here. And then if you're compressing a spring, putting more um, work into the body itself, you'd end up with a positive work term. And then for a couple moment, this is similar to virtual work um, in statics, but in a couple moment, all we need to do is multiply the moment times the angular displacement. So if that moment is non-constant, we can integrate it. If it is constant, we can just multiply moment and the displacement. The displacement must be in radians. Do not forget that, that this theta must 100% of the time be in radians in order to get a, um, a comprehensible solution or a correct solution. And once again, if our if our moment is in the direction of our delta theta, positive, opposite direction, negative. So that's the general idea on work and energy. We combine that then into the overall work and energy equation, where kinetic energy initial plus our work that goes into the system between initial and final is equal to our kinetic energy final. The summations out front here are basically looking at that if there's multiple bodies, you need to add in the kinetic energy of all these bodies together. Now that only works in systems that have um, constrained motion. So if one body's moving, other bodies have to move with it. And in dynamics so far, we've only given you constrained motion type of systems, really one degree of freedom type systems. Now, conservation of energy, it's up to you if you want to think in this time, this framework or not. I really typically draw the line right here at work and energy um, and kind of leave everything in terms of work and kinetic energy, but you could redefine things, flipping around your signs on gravitational potential energy, on elastic potential energy, and then really having this initial kinetic plus initial potential equals final kinetic plus final potential. But you'll get the same answer in either of these two cases. Cases. It's just that in conservation, you can't have any external force terms. So we'll wrap up our discussion here of rigid body kinetics, looking at impulse and momentum. 
Uh, impulse and momentum have a fairly similar construct to particles. Once again, we're just going to add in some rotational pieces. We know that our linear momentum, which we often use the variable g for, is going to be the mass times the velocity vector. Now, this is going to be the velocity vector of the centroid, right? That is v bar, and we need to use that velocity there of the centroid. No other choice but to use that. Once again, for angular momentum, this is really similar to chapter 17, where if we take the angular momentum about the centroid, it's going to be i bar times omega omega in this case, right? So not some of the moments equals I bar alpha from chapter 17, but now this is impulse momentum. And so this is the angular momentum equal to I bar times omega. Now, if we shift the point we want to find our angular momentum about, here's the equation over here, still our I bar times omega. And then we add in this, um, really it's a, a kinetic momentum term, right? It's, uh, it's our, our distance over to the velocity of the centroid. Now you can either factor the mass out here or you can combine that mass with the velocity term right there. Uh, noting that all of the signs in this equation come from the right-hand rule. Technically, jumping down here, all of the signs in either one of these total impulse momentum equations come from the right-hand rule. So even if it's an unknown um, angular velocity omega, make sure that if it's assumed to be going in the negative direction that you put a negative out front here as you go through and compute it. There is some um, different ways of handling the sign conventions on that right-hand rule. I really like just using the right-hand rule for everything, not redefining right-hand rule into the left-hand rule, the opposite direction. And like I said, the only difference there is you need to make sure that you wouldn't add in a negative sign, even if it's an unknown term, if you're assuming it's going in a negative, which would be a clockwise direction. Let's just go ahead and finish out these angular terms, and I'll jump back here to the linear. And so in angular, if we're summing moments about the centroid G, then we can have our moment of inertia about the centroid G, both initial and final. Once again, we can do this for multiple particles and add together all of the different initial angular momentum, impulse momentum happening on the multiple bodies, and then final um, angular momentum. That's basically these green summations on the outside. Now, if we want to sum our moments about some other point, say that we have some forces that we're not interested in or not asked to solve for, then we can shift that point over to point P. Now we're going to have this overall term right here equal to the initial angular momentum. Now this cross product here um, is, is exactly the same as what we did in chapter 17, as we looked at in that interactive. The only difference here is we're looking at the velocity of the centroid versus the acceleration of the centroid. So that's our initial angular momentum. Our final angular momentum is over here. And then our impulse term, angular impulse term here in the middle looks just the same. It's just we'll have some different forces because we're summing those moments around a different point on that body. Um, and then up back up here to the linear. Once again, the linear has to be the velocity here of the centroid, both initial and final. And this really just shows that split, that if we do have both motion in the x direction and y direction, then we have two equations to look at two unknowns. And so in total here, we have a total of three equations, one for linear x, one for linear y, and then one of these two, but not both, um, for angular momentum. So we do have three equations for three unknowns. Hopefully that helped you review your knowledge of rigid body kinetics.